Welcome to RPV City Talk. I'm Liz Brown Swanson here with Rancho Palace Verde's Mayor Dave Bradley at Terranea Resort, bringing you the mayor's monthly update. Very exciting. Welcome. Thank you very much, Liz. It's exciting to be here on my first uh, mayor's talk, as well as my first mayor's breakfast, which we just finished up with this morning. That's right. You have a monthly mayor's breakfast. You meet with the commission and committee chairs for yes. our city. All volunteers um, share what how that went, the mayor's breakfast, and some of the highlights. So it went really well this morning. So it was a kicking off of the year, uh, talking to all the committees and commissions. Um, Captain Powers from the Lamita Sheriff Station is also here with us, talking about public safety as well as uh, Armour and our city manager. So we kind of go over with the different committees and the different uh, commissions uh, what my priorities are for the year and what's going on in the city. Um, the Finance Advisory Committee is talking about, you know, how we're going to fund some of our infrastructure projects. Um, the IMAC or Infrastructure Management Committee is talking about some of our infrastructure projects as we go forward. Uh, the Finance Advisory Committee, kind of how we're going to pay for all that as we go forward. Traffic safety. Um, on uh, some of the issues that we've had with traffic calming and some of the uh, issues with traffic um, and our planning commission, um, which is always out in front on our local control and our land use issues. So um, all of those together, um, really helping with the, uh, with the city and helping with the city council uh, in community outreach, as well as uh, helping us uh, work with our work product because there's just too much stuff for the council to do on our own. Right, all these committees and commissions want to thank the volunteers, um, like for example, the Civic Center Advisory Committee, oh, huge thank you. charge. I forgot. Civic we Center have to inviting. mention them because this yes. is something that we're going to be talking about from days, months, years to come about the city's future with building a new Civic Center. Very important committee, of course. But they do, like you say, a lot of groundwork um, for the council because you're all volunteers. And they actually just met recently before the council. They'll come every, what, six months and yep. give you a status report and you just bounce ideas. So it's really, really amazing work. And uh, we They're want to thank them all. They're critical to us being able to move forward. And one last thing. So you did meet here with the breakfast as mayor. Every month you'll be meeting with these chairs and yep. hearing, getting a pulse of Rancho Palos Verdes. Um, where will you go next? So after this, we're going to go back um, over to the Trump National Golf Course and right. uh, meet right over there. Right down the stretch yeah, here. In fact, right behind us. It's a beautiful day here at Terranea. Um, a light Santa Ana breeze blowing, but it is fantastic to be back at Terranea. Uh, Terranea um, has really come back after uh, COVID and is doing really well. Um, they still have some challenges, but it's exciting to see um, our second major employer within the city uh, bouncing back. And it and of course, Terranea being a huge contributor to the city's coffers, the revenues generated even during the pandemic, still the the hundreds of thousands of dollars that we receive. Like Absolutely. 50 this, million since they've opened. The city depends on Terranea uh, to help fund our uh, general fund. Um, they've continued to be a great partner with the city as we move forward. Um, though they were struggling uh, during the, uh, the high point of the pandemic. Um, Rancho Palos Verdes fortunately has a very conservative fiscal policy. And even though we saw a major downturn in revenue from transit occupancy tax, sales tax, golf tax, and things like that, uh, we were able to still have a budget that closed and not really have to uh, retard city services as we go forward. So that's a testament to prior councils and our, and our city staff for having a very conservative fiscal policy that didn't uh, uh, mean we had to cut back uh, during the downturn. So kind of a kudos to us. Yes, and so grateful to have this jewel in our community uh, for everyone to enjoy, just to come and take a beautiful walk, enjoy the nature that's here, uh, grab a coffee and, you know, have a staycation. Support Terranea and thank you for the staff always being so great to our city and RPV TV to set up our shoots here, what a spot. Um, Let's talk about a little bit more about what's going on with the pandemic. Always a challenge um, as our city continues to navigate. City Hall was closed for the month of January to the public, the uh, Point Vicente Interpretive Center. So just give us an update on where we're going and how we are navigating and the city's response right now. So the city is trying to mitigate the risk. And so we have uh, closed City Hall to walk-ins. You can still access City Hall via appointment. Uh, Point Vicente Interpretive Center was closed. Uh, we'll be reopening Point Vicente Interpretive Center uh, this, uh, the beginning of February. So we're gonna play that by ear. 
Um, as Omicron had spiked, we really thought that it was um, the best course of action to limit risk to our residents and to visitors and really limit in-person access. Uh, it wasn't something we do lightly, but it's something that we wanted to do to protect the public and uh, protect our staff as we go forward. So um, we've been pretty successful with uh, protecting our staff. Uh, we've had some COVID cases within city staff, mm -hmm. but generally um, uh, we've been trying to stay ahead of it and uh, be as, um, conservative, well, not conservative, but as safe as possible and mitigate the risk of COVID. And of course, we always, throughout this mayor show, we'll plug our city website, rpvca.gov, always updating what's going on with our COVID cases, information from the county, what's open, what's not. And of course, with city council meetings, whether you can come in person right now, still hybrid. So city council and the planning commission are both still being done hybrid. So, um, which actually has been a really boon to transparency to, for the city. Mm -hmm. So we're allow the public to participate in multiple ways for the city council. You can um, leave a message, um, a voicemail. You can zoom in. You can do a pre-recorded Zoom uh, message to uh, the city council during our council meetings, um, as well as we have gone back and forth allowing the public to come into the council chambers uh, when it's safe to do so uh, to provide comments there. So it, it's really a way that we feel that we've been able to open up participation with the, uh, with the public. And we're excited that uh, we still are, are able to offer up those different options. You were sworn in as mayor December 7th when the city has their annual reorganization. So this is our first time having you really for this monthly mayor show to kind of talk more about your goals as mayor and your vision. So uh, one of the first goals always is uh, maintain our focus on public safety um, and work with the Lamita Sheriff's um, Station and our captain uh, Jim Powers in making sure that we uh, are as responsive uh, and protective of both our community, our residents, and our businesses. So we're going to continue to focus on public safety, making sure that uh, the uh, Sheriff's Department is able to help us um, as much as possible. And on that note, the uh, Captain Powers was present at your monthly marriage Absolutely. breakfast, and he shared at least for the month of January, things are looking better. Crime was on going down after we saw a little uptick at the end of last year, but the numbers are always fluid, but we are still, still I think, safe, one of the fourth top safest cities in California, so that's kudos to us. Absolutely, we are one of the safest cities in California, but when it comes to public safety, you know, there is never too much, but we do still have some um, uh, some burglaries within the city, mm -hmm. some auto theft within the city. Uh, we're working on techniques and identification of areas of concern uh, to try to mitigate that as much as possible. So uh, we're committed to being an even safer city. Right, and also the community itself always needs to be doing their part. We always say, if you see something, say something. Um, but it makes a big difference, you know, install those security cameras. The city partners with neighborhoods to do that as well um, because you can never have enough, you know, we can never be doing enough layering. Oh, absolutely. Right? So, and other goals, um, you know, talking about, I know you're really focused on maintaining local control in our city. We see what's happening with Sacramento, how it's impacting us in so many ways, um, ways we don't want. You know, things that we're being forced to do. Absolutely. It's interesting that on the eve of the 50th birthday of the city, right. which will come up next year in 2023, we're back to talking about local control, which was one of the primary reasons the city was formed back in 1973. Um, some of the, what I consider existential threats to the city are some of the housing policies that are coming out of Sacramento. Um, unfortunately, while with the best intention, the effect of what they're doing is taking away local control and trying to use a one-size-fits-all uh, policy uh, that is really going to impact our city and not in a positive way. So we are working with um, uh, various state agencies and uh, other cities on how we can mitigate the negative impacts of Senate Bill 9, Senate Bill 10, um, and some of the arena housing allocation numbers that were being forced upon uh, the city. Uh, some of them are going to, uh, to, if fully implemented, completely change the tenor of the city. Um, and in our area, it will just have massive negative impacts. Okay. 
Any other goals you want to share before we move on to one thing we do in this show is look at city council action um, that you've taken at recent meetings. Sure. So a couple other goals that we have is, um, as most of our residents, I think, know, um, the Point Vicente Coast Guard Station is no longer an active housing area. Uh, the Coast Guard housing has now moved down to Terminal Island at the main uh, Los Angeles Coast Guard base. Uh, so we're working with the Coast Guard to see what we can do to operate Point Vicente um, Lighthouse, which is a cultural landmark for the city, um, in, in joint partnership with the Coast Guard. Also, the Bunker Battery property up next to the uh, Civic Center redevelopment is an abandoned uh, World War II battery site that was part of the Nike missile site. And we're working with the Coast Guard on how to best utilize that property as we build out a new Civic Center. Um, other goals that we have for the year is getting ready for next year, which is kicking off the 50th anniversary celebration of the founding of this city. It's really exciting that uh, Ken Dida, one of our original city founders, is on the city council in our 49th year. Um, and Ken is going to be an integral part to our 50th year celebration as we uh, dedicate the Civic Center to Ken later this year. And we move forward with celebrating uh, the founding of Rancho Palos Verdes as we move into our second half century. Right. Since we're talking about Council Member Dida, who is a legend, um, founder of our city, I'm extraordinary that he's still on the council 50 years later. And I think he would tell you, you know, the city is pretty much like it was, you know, the same population, lawless open space preserve. And, and that's such a tribute to every council, including the current one. Um, but when the council made that decision to name the, um, the city hall and the, uh, the roadway, right, to go in after Ken, can you give us a little update on how that all took place? Because I know there's different policies on how you can name after a public official in the community. Right, so we have a uh, council policy that uh, nothing would be named after a living person within the city. And, and I generally fully support that policy is I think, you know, a lot of places you see everything, including the park bench named after somebody, um, and it can be very self-serving. Um, rarely do you get an opportunity to honor what I consider a living legend, somebody that helped uh, found the city and move our city forward who is still serving 49 years later so um, I moved within council to um, make an exception to that policy for this one extraordinary individual uh, fortunately the rest of my council uh, felt strongly as well and we decided that we would um, set aside that policy for this one specific uh, instance and this one specific individual and uh, and be able to uh, honor Ken Dida uh, while he's alive and while he's serving um, to show him the respect and admiration the city has for what he's done in the past. He's amazing and he's so humble about it all. Absolutely. So we look forward to that future naming so stay tuned for that. Um, we're going to move on to talk a little bit about uh, issues, major issues, so many issues right now in our city. We could talk about everything from right behind us, what's going on with the, the landslide efforts. But we're going to focus on some of the council votes recently taken. A big issue making headlines is right, we, it, they, it's right behind us, Hatano Farm, yes. um, the property there. Uh, the future of Hatano Farm in this city and the lease. Explain what's going on for residents, especially that aren't following this, because it is a big deal. Um, so just give us a little history of what's going on with this operation and the issue. Sure. So Hatano Farm is the last continuously operating heritage Japanese farm left in the city. At one point, we had over 20 active commercial farms within the city. And over the years, uh, aging population, all of those farms have ceased to exist. The Hitano farm is the last farm that's still operating. Um, Mr. Hitano, who was operating the farm, has passed away. And his uh, former foreman that came to work for him in the early 80s is still operating the farm. So this is the last vestige of an operational commercial farm uh, from our Japanese heritage. Um, when the Civic Center and that portion of land was transferred to the city, there were some um, provisos in that transfer from the federal government on what we could do with it. Um, the current operation is not explicitly allowed within the uh, provisos of the land transfer. 
Um, I believe, though, that we should still continue to honor the heritage. And um, I think honoring the heritage with an operational farm is so much more moving than placing a plaque. I mean, some folks have talked about putting a plaque. Uh, the issue comes across right now is because of the land values and the heritage nature of the lease that the city has been giving to the Hatano farm. Which is $100 a year. Which is $100 a year. There, there are those, yeah, there are those on the council that believe that is a gift of public funds. Um, we are looking and have sent staff back to look at different ways that we could continue to operate the farm. Uh, potentially restructure it. Um, we are looking at partnerships with the Palos Verde East Peninsula Land Conservancy um, and other agencies within the, within, the, uh, within the city to see if we can come up with a better win-win situation. I unfortunately on the first vote was in the um, uh, minority in a four to one vote uh, to terminate the lease. Uh, fortunately at the last council meeting, we uh, voted to reconsider uh, not that we were going to reinstate the lease, but at least that we were going to reconsider reinstating the lease and have city staff come back to us with a bunch of options um, to, so for us to move forward. Well, thank you for that update. Um, now we're going to have you update us on other council action uh, agenda items. One had to do with the EDCO contract for our trash removal in our community and also um, what's going on with uh, solutions for parking at Ladera Linda. So, why don't you just give sure. us a little so update Ed on those two items? Absolutely. So EDCO, we recently signed a, uh, um, a seven-year agreement with EDCO to increase their uh, service uh, due to a piece of legislation that came into uh, effect the beginning of January, which is we had to come up with a way to recycle um, organic um, household waste, basically kitchen garbage, unused food and put that into uh, the organic um, uh, recycling. Um, so we've modified EDCO's contract, uh, we've extended the contract and we were able to negotiate a seven-year contract with EDCO uh, for that. Uh, the unfortunate portion of that is because we are actually adding to the service and adding to what we're asking EDCO to do. Uh, our um, waste hauling uh, price to each of our residents will go up approximately five dollars uh, per month uh, in the next year and then there is a uh, modest escalation um, uh, for inflation over the um, the next seven years um, we are working with um, other cities in Palos Verdes to see if there's any way that we can uh, bundle services and see if we can get some economic value with some of our other cities, but that's in early negotiations. We talked next about up the street here with what's just an update on what's going on with the uh, Ladera Linda Community Park Project and uh, temporary parking plans that could happen while the construction's going on. Absolutely. So right now, Ladera Linda, the current community park, is uh, used for paddle tennis, for recreation, for people playing on the on the lower basketball courts in the lower field. Uh, when we break ground on Ladera Linda, the uh, revitalization project later this year, um, all that will be closed. That will be part of the construction laydown area. Um, so we're looking at different parking uh, scenarios, uh, whether parking up behind the Forestall uh, or Forestall Gate, which is a gate that uh, separates AYSO parking from the um, current Ladera Linda Park, um, or parking along Forestall Drive. So we're doing various studies primarily to minimize the impact on any of the local residents to the maximum extent possible. We want to make sure that we've learned from our parking challenges up at uh, Del Cerro. And um, as we put in some parking mitigation um, solutions up there, learn from those lessons and not create those same issues on Forestall Drive going up to Ladera Linda uh, that we learned at Del Cerro. So we're working with the community we're working with city staff and we're trying to come up with the best solution possible. Right. So I know that there you have you're starting to sort of going to start collecting data. You're opening the gate up then. We're going to open the gate up. We're going to put in a traffic counting measure. We're going to use, you know, we're going to go ultra low tech and we're going to go back to the um, 
the air sensor where it's just a tube that will collect the data, uh, very similar to some of us grew up when you pulled into a gas station. Um, I know for some of our viewers, they never have seen a uh, full serve gas station, but we're going to go into use some of that uh, some of that technology. All right. Well, we'll stay tuned for the information as you collect it. And obviously, always the focus is to make sure the neighbors up there um, there's like little to no impact on when all this is happening. Absolutely. But exciting that the ribbon cutting and the groundbreaking will be happening soon while you're mayor. So that'll be, we'll stay tuned for that as well. Um, beautification grant program yep. has been reinstated by this city council. Um, explain the decision to bring it back and how it works. So it's a program that I think was in effect about 10 years ago where individual communities, community associations could uh, request beautification funds for uh, markers towards to the uh, entrance of various tracks. Um, it was suspended, I think about 10 years ago um, uh, for financial reasons. Um, but we've thought that, you know, what better way to beautify the city than to allow us to give grants to various community groups who know their communities and their local micro um, homeowners association best. So we've uh, reinstated those grants. Uh, you can request up to $5,000 to help with the uh, beautification of the entrance to your a neighborhood or tract. Um, it's an exciting program. It is getting rave reviews. Most of the homeowners associations are very appreciative uh, that we brought this back and are giving them some resources to really help themselves. So you need to go on the city website to get the information Absolutely. and the application. I know I always say I live in Seaview, so I can see think of some landscaping ideas. We got to get 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 those applications in. I think you need to get them in by April. Please check the website. Yes, yes. Um, well, I want to move on to talk about some other fun things in the city. Uh, well, we look Mac Becky Martin, a employee, almost as here as long as Ken died at 50 years, right? 47 years she served our city. Yes. And we had a big send off for her. You did as mayor at the council Absolutely. chambers. Um, just talk about that. That just does have anybody work at the same job for 47 years and, and in the city, right? She yeah. wore many hats and we said goodbye to her. She went through many departments within the city. She was a, um, you know, a resource for the city. Uh, when she came to the city, the city was just a baby. I think uh, the city was three years old uh, when Becky Martin started with <laughs> us and yeah. uh, was able to take a career spanning over 45 years of service to the city. And it was really special to be able to give her a send off. Um, and we made a, a, a Rancho Palos Verdes uh, street sign for her that said Becky's Way um, as she has served the city for so long and so dedicated. Um, we expect to see her on the trails in the preserve, um, out walking, and we wish her absolutely the best in her next chapter of, uh, of her journey. Right, when she retired, she was in public works, but she had been in Reckon Parks all over. She'd been in Reckon Parks, she'd been in community development. She, yeah, she was all over. She truly was a, uh, was a, uh, a city gem. She was very special. Um, and as we're starting to wrap up this show, um, we have to end sort of what on a somber note, our city has been mourning the loss of LA County firefighter Jonathan Flagler, who was at Merrill S Station 83. He actually grew up in our community. Um, devastating when he lost his life uh, battling a house fire in our city um, on January 6th. Absolutely. Um, the city and the community, the outpouring of love and support. You've been involved as mayor to share how we are re responding to the family and the firefighters to show that support still. So it was, you know, with, uh, you know, a really heavy heart that we woke up uh, the morning of January 6th and found out that there had been a residential house fire within the city and um, L.A. County Fire responded to it. Uh, unfortunately, early that morning, Jonathan Flagler uh, was critically injured, uh, helping defend uh, life and property here within the city. He was rushed to Harbor UCLA. A medical center um, and unfortunately succumbed to his injuries. Um, after that there's been a tremendous outpouring of uh, support and sympathy. Um, the uh, makeshift memorial at station 83 in Marilis Plaza has continually had flowers and wreaths and mementos placed there um, in honor of uh, Jonathan Flagler. Um, I didn't realize this at the time but Jonathan was born at Little Company of Mary Hospital in San Pedro. And then um, 
uh, lived with his parents um, there off of Western in what was then uh, uh, incorporated as part of Rancho Palos Verdes. Um, he lived there with his, uh, after his parents had passed, lived there with his wife before they moved to San Clemente. Um, he was a Department of Vernon firefighter until the fire, uh, Department of Vernon was taken over by LA County Fire. And that's when Jonathan came back and was um, stationed at uh, Station 83 in Mariles Plaza. So he was working and, uh, and supporting the city that he grew up in. Uh, a stone's throw from where he was born when unfortunately he made the ultimate sacrifice and, um, and perished. Um, last week I had the opportunity and the honor to go both to the flag folding ceremony at Fire Station 1 in the city of Vernon uh, where they uh, um, took down his the flag flying over both eight, Station 83 as well as the fire station in Vernon where he had served for many years. Um, folded that and then that flag was presented to his widow and his two sons at the memorial service in Orange County uh, that occurred last Friday. Um, very moving ceremony, um, outpouring from fire departments all over the state um, as well as law enforcement all over the state. Um, I know the county supervisors uh, were all there and it was a, a very moving ceremony. Um, our thoughts and prayers go out to uh, Jonathan's widow and his two sons. Um, and if anybody wants to contribute to the funds, uh, the LA County Firemen's Firefighters Association has a fund set up to support the family. Uh, go to the city website and there will be a link in that uh, to the uh, LA County Firefighters Association uh, support um, page. And you can uh, donate that way. But true dedication um, of our LA County firefighters and we can't say enough on how much we appreciate what they do for us every day keeping us safe and uh, protecting life and property. The courage that these firefighters and public service officials like this do to protect all of us and also you know just we want to thank everyone out there that's out there um, trying to protect us all and again in honor of um, Jonathan Flagler and his family will we'll close this show in, in his memory. And do go to the city website and, and to contribute um, to the Jonathan Flagler Memorial Fund, who was taken way too soon. He was 47. Yes. And uh, so, and thank you, Mayor, because it's these difficult times when you're mayor. Um, you know, you're there for the ribbon cuttings, but you're also there for situations like this to support. And that's what we do. We can only be there for each other. Um, on that note, we are going to wrap up here at Terranea. Any final mayor's announcements you'd need to make um, just to our community watching? Only thing I would say is it's going to be a phenomenal 49th year. Um, I'm excited to be mayor. I feel honored to be mayor of the city I grew up in. Um, so this is going to be an exciting year. I can't wait to uh, see where we'll be. Hopefully we've turned the corner on COVID and the impacts of COVID are going to be uh, less and less as we move into the year and get prepared for our 50th anniversary. So thank you everyone for watching um, and we will uh, talk to you next month. <laughs> All right, thank you for joining us on RPV City Talk. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks.